Pennsylvania's podcast member is Mitch Wheeler from PennsylvaniaKings.com. If you want to learn how to become a better artist, come check us out over there. We've got tons of courses, very friendly community, uh, and I'm there as well. I formerly was a technical art director at Activision Blizzard, so lots of experience in video games and film and all kinds of stuff. And I'm basically an open book and I want to help people out. I've also got, uh, I need to do a better job at mentioning all this stuff, so I'm just going to get out of the way. I have a book out on Amazon now called The Digital Artist Career Blueprint. So if you're interested, basically it takes you from when I was seven years old and decided I want to be a video game artist and how that whole confusing journey looks like till eventually uh, when I was 30 is when I left video games. Um, it takes you across the whole thing, building three different art studios. And um, I think all that actually ties in really nicely with today's guest, Derek Rodenbeck, who has had his own amazing journey. And um, we connected through a friend originally, I don't know now, maybe four years ago or so. He's very early on. And I followed up with Derek at different points. Um, he's a veteran. Uh, he's a comic book artist. He is, he's, But he's basically a renaissance man. And I think that we really connected because... One of the big things that I felt with, with wanting to be an artist was that I I knew what the traditional script looked like. I, I knew that, you know, the traditional script goes like this. You go to high school, you graduate, you then go to college and you graduate. Hopefully you meet your partner, whoever that is, uh, in your college years. Uh, then you, you get your job. Uh, then you usually would get a house together with your with your partner, get married have a kid and then that takes you probably to about 27 or 30 and then <laughs> from there it's raising the kid and continue on with your job until you eventually retire and to me that just sounded totally boring and if yeah. you took that path that you know more power to you everybody I'm fully on board with everybody doing their thing that they want to do but to me it just felt like it was a story that I already knew and mm. a story that I was familiar and I wanted to have a weird story uh, so basically, whatever the normal path was, I tried to do the opposite. I dropped out of school. I, I got through my school as quickly as possible. I skipped my graduation. I went to China. I did all kinds of weird stuff that is not the normal script. And I feel like Derek has, has done similar. So welcome back to the call, Derek. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Thank you so much for having me, man. It's been way too long. Yeah, definitely. And I for people who maybe haven't gone back, I'm going to bundle all these together, but how long ago were you living in your car? Because this is a at some oh, point geez. in the journey. Yeah. I feel like <laughs> this is a, maybe a good starting point just yeah. to just to preface this and we'll get into kind of the, the beats along that path and just I'm more interested in where you are now because we've gone through those other stories, but let's catch everybody up. Yeah, that sounds good. I think uh geez, that that has to be like five years ago. Living in my car. Yeah, so I was living in my car for four months and all the while still working at a bar, bouncing and doing all that good stuff and working all night. Um, but yeah, yeah, that was literally five, about five years ago. And, and had you graduated at that time? I graduated from the Gubert School, actually. Yeah, so you had graduated, but then you were, at this point, you were in your car. Yeah, yeah. And were you also bodybuilding at that time? Were you shredded when you were in your car? Because I feel like you're a little yeah. bit smaller than you were in, in, in <laughs> Thanks. <previous calls. laughs> yeah. hey man yeah, no, eyes, right? no it is it is it's true um yeah i am smaller now <laughs> but um and i was uh heavily into bodybuilding and strong man um i actually had an injury about two years ago so i actually didn't like weight train for a year and now i've been getting back into uh rebuilding the structure which has been actually pretty humbling and a lot of fun so um I actually enjoy that process. <laughs> and so I, I think this is an important part. So it wasn't just you alone in your car. You also had your dog, which I, you know, we, we met yeah. in Philadelphia once. And, yeah. and how many pounds is your dog to give people, give dog owners a sense of how sure. big this dog is massive? Yeah. Um, Kuma, he recently passed away this past October, oh. which has been like, really, it was, yeah, it was, it was a really big hurdle for me. And um, just a, kind of like a little segue here. I actually, when I got married recently, we're jumping ahead a little, I took him with me. I drove him across country like his ashes. And then um, I took him to like Death Valley and we just kind of sat on a salt flats and stuff. But um, to answer the question, he was 150 pounds. So it was myself in a 1998 Subaru Legacy with Kuma in the back and then half of the trunk 
was his dog food. I mean, I could send you a picture of this. I mean, it's I've I I remember documenting this because I was like, one day I'm gonna look back at all this and just be like, this that was crazy. Um, and then it was like kind of like a wet dog smell, and then me and I, I on occasion I'd get time either to sleep in my car or I would have a friend that I could crash with, which eventually was uh, Nick Hagialis, who had been on the show prior. Yeah. Um, he, him and his fiance now, um, they eventually invited me to their house after a couple months. And he was like, dude, like you just, just, you got to stay with us. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, you know, the, I, I wish this was a story that I hadn't heard before, but I've worked with people who, you know, we were working on movies and there was one person who was in a similar situation living in his car because he was using the money to support his parents and right. just making those sacrifices. Um, so, all right. So the whole time that I've known you, you've been doing comics. Um, and I believe the last time that we caught up, you were on this road trip when I remember you telling me, hey, I'm going to go on this road trip. Uh, my girlfriend, you know, now, now wife, but girlfriend at the time, we're going to go on this road trip. And I was just like, what? This, <laughs> and, yeah, and I think you said, we want, we want to be more with nature. And I just, feel like, <laughs> again, I've heard people say these things to me and in my own gut response, cause this is not something that I would want to do for ex an extended period of time. Just like, that sounds crazy. Yeah. I wonder what's going to happen, but you had this amazing adventure. So maybe you could tell us yeah. a couple of the highlights of, uh, of that trip. Um, sure. And I, and I, I promised like I could go for probably four hours talking about this. So I'm really going to condense things here <laughs> for you. Um, but essentially we set out and we were only planning to leave for about a month. Uh, she would, she just graduated law school and we were thinking, Hey, we got a little bit of time essentially. So she wanted to get her yoga certification in San Francisco. And I was like, yeah, let's go, you know. Um, and it was actually one of my first breaches back into photography as well. My buddy, um, he had a couple cameras and was just like, hey, man, I know you're going on this thing. You won't be gone long. Um, you just want to take my, my camera? Like, you know, just give it back to me whenever <laughs> that I was gone for six months. <laughs> so when I came back, I gave him 600 bucks. I was like, here, man, just, uh, I'm just going to buy it from you. <laughs> you know? uh, which he appreciated. But um, yeah, um, we ended up going to San Francisco where her, her brother and his boyfriend lives and we stayed with them. So we, we really didn't have a lot of overhead other than getting there. Mm -hmm. And I think the whole trip was like climactic but initially that first week of traveling from vermont all the way i live in philly but her her dad has a house in vermont so we were staying up there going from vermont and then all the way to san francisco like dude i don't know what was going on but the weather was just like no you're gonna drive in a snowstorm the entire way <laughs> so yeah so like when we left vermont snowstorm we got to like lake erie area and buffalo hit another snowstorm and i mean these things were like gnarly like bad snowstorms you know things you do not want to be in uh got to denver and um when i was in denver we're like oh yeah you know it's kind of a clear sky this is great and um basically we got into the mountains snowstorm you know going down a mountain like bad finally got into the deserts of Utah, you know, and we're like, oh, wow, you know, got to Moab and no snow, actually kind of warm, you know, let down our guard, spent a little bit of time there, went to Dead Horse State Park. Um, it's kind of an overlooked place, so I almost don't want to tell people about it, but like, I think more people are coming aware of it. It's beautiful. Um, so go to Dead Horse State Park. Um, and we left there. So, and our initial plan was to go through the Sierras. And I, I guess the Sierras are just notorious for, you know, just being, they can be like really dangerous, you know? And, and this is where I really gained a huge, a huge amount of respect for mountains and just, 
I, I mean, I already had a respect for nature, but even more so of like sort of my insignificance in relation to like nature doesn't care, <laughs> you know? Um, so we went to this small town called Ely in Nevada. And in this town, like it's kind of like this place where the Weather Channel doesn't even report anything anymore there. You know, it's just like you kind of get the weather. Um, and we set out, we, we stayed there the night and we set out the next day because we were going to cut through the mountains. And yeah, man, as soon as we got like a half hour into our trip, hit a really bad snowstorm and our car actually got stuck um, about probably an hour into me trying to dig it out because I brought this like little e-tool shovel. Um, this guy pulls up, he was a rancher, probably, I don't know, 23 years old. His name was Peyton. And he, he looks at me, he sees the two dogs in the car, looks at my wife. And he's like, you guys need some help. <laughs> you know? And we're like, yeah, yeah, that'd be great. And um, he's like, all right, well, my ranch is 40 miles that way. Um, if you want to hop in and help me, cause he had like this horse attachment to his truck. He's like, I need to offload this, this cage, you know, with the horse, you could put the dogs in the back and then, you know, just hop in and, and we'll go and, you know, I'll come back and, you know, pull you out. <laughs> you know, it's so sketchy, <laughs> you know, the first thing you're like, we're going into the back country of Nevada in the middle of a like snowstorm but this really is our only option right now. So you almost got to like, just trust your gut at the time. Be like, he seems like a good guy. <laughs> so <laughs> we, we do this, you know, and just like the trip there was wild. Um, basically like driving through six inches of snow and we get to his ranch after probably an hour, basically unload everything get the dogs in the truck, drive all the way back. And then he pulls us out, follows us into town. And the whole while just talking to us, you know, he's like, I sometimes don't see people for like a month, um, you know, cause he manages like 80 miles of land and it was just beautiful back there. Um, but he essentially like saved our life, <laughs> you know? Um, so, the, the interesting thing is literally the next day we decided we were going to take the long route and travel down and around the Sierras because they were just getting hammered with snow. And, uh, you know, paint paint set us up pretty well with, um, he, he gave us some fire, which I regretfully like and embarrassingly didn't have. And, um, just kind of told us was like, what do you mean by fire? Like just candles? Because I, I know that's uh, what we we often take uh, here in Canada is is have some candles in your car in the winter yeah. time because you're just we're, we're never that far away from civilization where I live, but you never you also never know that um, you know you could just be unlucky and have to overnight it. Yep, uh, I actually carry this with me everywhere now. This is what he actually gave me. This little bag and it's so you can start a fire it's just got some dry stuff in it and yeah so that's kind of funny um yeah and i've, I've held on to that actually you know taking it everywhere with me so um yeah yeah from from there he, he was saying you know i every year i find people free that freeze to death in their car you know and Whoa. have to you know either pull them out or call somebody or you know, it is what it is. So, um, yeah, I'm glad that wasn't the scenario for us. <laughs> uh, the next day, we were traveling through Death Valley, and it was kind of like in the middle of the night. And there was a truck trucker. His name was Brandon, and really, really nice guy. Um, and I, I, I'll condense this one. We got to kind of pay it forward. Um, he was going to go back in his truck, and I told him, I was like, hey, man. You can't go back in there. Um, come in with us. Uh, he was. We just found him on the side of the road, and he basically like his brakes gave out going down a mountain, and he put his truck into the sand. And um, now, are we talking like a, a eighteen wheeler? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Big yeah. Truck. Big truck. Holler. And I take a, a flare out from my car, you know, strike it, and just kind of toss it near the uh, where the incident was, because as soon as I got up there, you know, I I saw that the brakes were kind of on fire 
And I turned to him, I was like, dude, we gotta, we gotta go. You know, so we run back to the car. As soon as we get into the car, um, the whole truck just lights up, gone, completely on fire, gone. So now, we this, drove back into was town. This, and I, I think you told this story when we last talked. Yeah. W was it like a slow burn or was it like a movie? This thing exploded <laughs> everywhere. And you guys are kind of like dying. You know, I, I imagine it wasn't like that. But what, what, Michael was it, Bay. what was it actually like? It just – it's like compounding interest, and I hate to like even compare it to that. It's just like slowly, and then it was just like <laughs> – you know, gone. Gotcha. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like I, I remember I, I'm so afraid of fire now. And when I was a kid playing around with fire and just like lots of kids do, and it got out of control, it, it gets out of control so fast. Like fire yeah. just can turn on you like an instant. And now I'm just, yeah. if I, whenever I see somebody pl playing with it, it's just like, do not, Stop. it. you don't know what, yeah. what, like all these underlying things that how quickly this can just become a It's disaster. nature, man. So, yeah, it's nature. So that was that was the first week. And then we got to San Francisco and things things settled down quite a bit. And that's when I started doing stuff with Creative Live. And um yeah, yeah. Then from there we just kind of set out and we were initially it, it's kinda of like every week we were like, Oh, let's go here or let's there was no plan. So we were Airbnb in our, our place back in Philadelphia. So there was income there. We were um, both working remotely. So there was income there. But it, e each of those things was not enough to cover like our expenses. So we definitely, like, uh, like I was telling you, like irresponsibly put too much on credit cards. And then by the time we got back, we were like, Ooh, <laughs> yeah, which, which we paid off now. But, um, looking back, you're like, Oh man, that was irresponsible. <laughs> While you were being irresponsible, were you aware of the debt or were you just kind of putting it in the back of your mind? Totally putting it in the back of my, okay. our minds. Yeah. Yeah. But, I mean, but like for me, from the outside looking in, I don't feel like you could really put a price on that experience. Like yeah. this is a legit adventure. This is what we want and what we're trying to capture and live vicariously through watching videos and going on these like pre-planned packaged vacations and stuff. But this is like yeah. a real adventure. Mm -hmm. that I, I think it's harder and harder to have real adventures because it's so easy to live vicariously through right. whatever means we want. Uh, and for things to just be planned and organized for us. And, and it's fine to do it that way, but I really admire this plan. And again, I've met some people doing the credit card plan and it's yeah. not necessarily the, the way that I would ultimately suggest is the best way. But I mean, yeah, if once in your life you have an adventure and you got a little bit of debt to show for the story of your life, potentially the story of your life right, or, or the stories of your life and a, a life changing experience, like, I don't know. I I would put that up against a college exp uh, education, you know, six I'd months on the road agree. or something. Yeah. 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 I mean, you learned a lot, but uh, initially we, A, learned a lot about each other, like our relationship grew. And I mean, we were, I, I, I'm the guy that ran after her in a park, you know, and instantly fell in love with her. And, you know, she'll say she fell in love like a couple days after me just to beat me, you know, <laughs> but, um, uh, I, this, this like gave us time to actually really get to know each other. So our relationship for that six months was really like years just due to the amount of time we spent with each other in like close proximity. And uh, one thing I always like to joke is if you ever want to test your relationship and especially if you're getting married, go on a road trip where you have to camp <laughs> with them, <laughs> with like, dogs or something you know like make it a little chaotic yeah. Yeah. and see how you respond to each other because i think fundamentally for me the most important decision i've ever made in my life is actually choosing the right partner and somebody that i admire but also challenges me and elevates me and i elevate in return and we like counterbalance each other in uh different ways and um yeah it's I think because, I mean, this is so cliche, but you are who you surround yourself with. And, dude, like, she motivates me so much 
in just thinking differently and just even going to school or, or, or whatever. Like, it's just, it's, I, I admire her a lot. So there's a, there's at least one other beat that I want to mention before we get get into talking about where you're at right now. And um, sure. at, at one point, Pokemon Go hit, and you made a bunch of money, um, right. like, riding riding the trend. And I think yes. you, you, I remember what you said was, you know, I proved to myself that I could make money and, and run a business. And so yeah. And when you said that, I got the sense of, like, it's like something that you checked off a box that you weren't, maybe you weren't sure if you could do it or not, or you were struggling to do it before, but once you had done yeah. it, it wasn't something that you worried about anymore. It's just sort of like, well, I know if I want to do this, I can do it again. So I'm going to choose to function, to focus on something else. And I think that's comes back yeah. to the, the, the Renaissance man aspect because I was, uh, you know, I don't go on social media a lot, but I was, I did see your photos on Facebook and Instagram. I'm just like, Wow, the, this is these are amazing photographs, and I feel like something must have come from those photographs. <clears throat> a lot, yeah. I mean, one thing that that Pokemon Go stint taught me was money matters, but it doesn't matter. And I, I guess I'll keep it like kind of that simple. It, it's money is necessary to give you freedom and opportunity and stability, but it also doesn't matter in a sense if you're not fulfilled and not happy and the work isn't something that you're aligned with. So that was like a really good lesson. And of also just kind of learning like, oh, well, there is opportunity to make money everywhere and at just different times, like right, even right now, like I like just flipping stuff on Craigslist and Facebook and eBay. And, you know, I think it was last month. It was just an extra, like, $4,000. And it's it's what? all just, just some yeah. Just stuff? And are you, okay, I got, I got what, what the heck are you flipping? Because I'm, and, and this is really interesting. The, when, when I travel, mm -hmm. uh, or when I did travel a lot, because I spent about six years on the road, uh, one of the things that one of the most fascinating questions I could ask people was, how are you funding your long term travel? Because when it, somebody's sure. gone for a week or something, they're in a whole different category as like what I would call like a long term or a permanent traveler. And right. long term permanent travelers, they all like three months, you have to have some kind of a plan. And like I said before, sometimes yeah. it's credit card. But the most common thing that I heard was flipping vehicles, boats, yeah. uh, cars. You know, they just be, and I think it's because the price point is so high that there's room for f for a, a difference in the market. But what are you flipping these? And you don't have to give away any secrets, but uh, sure. I mean, I I don't mind. Like there really aren't any secrets. I think it's just like doing in a sense. Like I live in a city, so you can people are either a giving away stuff that has value because mm -hmm. they just don't want it, and we live in like a really consumer based culture where people just acquire a lot of things. Um, so that be um, looking at things that I have and really like assessing like, is this necessary for me to have A, B, when's the last time I even like looked at this or utilized this and C, why do I feel I need this thing? And that helps really just, <laughs> I'm going to get rid of that. You know, I don't. I, I, I can utilize uh, the asset of having more in my savings than just having this like thing. So it's just wasteful. Um, and yeah, so if, what was it? The, the groups and that. And then just like if you see something on like Craigslist or something and you know that niche kind of. So whether it's like electronics or comic books or whatever and you're like, Hmm. I know I can get 50 bucks extra if I just flip that. So it's just like small things like that. And it adds up. You just throw it all up on eBay and people buy it. Wow. It, yeah. It, it's, it, it really is fascinating. I, um, I had never really done it until I was in the market for a computer and computer parts. And then I started looking yeah. and it just got started deep diving and there's all kinds of like price things and even like on Amazon the prices fluctuate on Amazon and you can see the like yeah. the tools that show you this price fluctuation and then you it doesn't take that long but you can, it's not like you can do it in an afternoon and really be it just it takes a little no. bit of time and then yeah it, okay that that's really, really yeah my thing was like list one thing every day so that's what I did for 
two months. And right now I have this like huge stack of comic books and I'm going to be selling those over the summer. And it's almost like overwhelming how many I have, but I'm like, okay, if I list four a day, five a day, that's really not that difficult. And they'll eventually sell. Mm -hmm. That's really cool. Yeah. I think it's something like it's, if you're listening, you're like, oh, I don't have money. I hear this all the time. It's like there is money That's like how. all yeah. around. You got to just change how you're thinking about stuff. And and you know, if you think you don't have money, try listing something. I'm I'm looking over here and I've got like boxes of video games that are still in their wrapping and that still are revel relevant. And that I'm sure somebody would be like, oh, cool, yeah. I can get this for less than retail. This would make a great birthday present. And then yeah, that's it's. It's almost like what's the point of having something if you're not using it? It's just there. Like it's taking up space. Yeah, it's, you know, like we have so many physical attachments to things. And I think that also has a lot to do with like fulfillment. And these are just like my personal philosophies and ideologies and whatnot. But like how fulfilled we are and acquiring and just hoarding and scarcity. And um, I think the more we open our minds to be like, Hey, you know, I can let go of a lot of this, this stuff. I can let go of, uh, just needing, you know, thinking I, I need this or that. And, um, that, that then leads you to actually having more opportunity because I mean, even if you like declutter a space, you know, and just, for example, I wouldn't want to do this, but like, say you just donate everything. Well, throw things out. I wouldn't mind donating, <laughs> but, um, it's almost like, you know, you have this like sigh of relief when you look in your room and it's just, there's not, there's not, like, not a lot there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, uh, you know, this, this is an art podcast. The reason we originally sure. talked about was because, um, you're a comic book creator and, um, yeah. but I think just your story and how you're living your life is far more well, especially to me, I think it's far more exciting to see somebody on a similar path of, of trying to, I, I guess, like live creative, be, be creatively fulfilled. And that, that, that really has no, you know, it's vague on purpose because there could be anything, mm -hmm. um, that you could, could fill that criteria. And so you, after, after the trip, you, you came back to Philadelphia um, you're on the path to, to get married, I'm guessing by this time, or if, if you're not engaged yet, it's, it's very close, yeah. but I'm more interested in, in the work and kind of like the creative aspects and how, how that all connected. Because from the outside looking in, I saw these photographs and I was like, wow, this, this can't not go somewhere. Like it must go somewhere. Some, these photographs must lead to something They're They're too right. good. And I don't know. Thank you. <laughs> I, I feel like it, like you're obviously we're put, putting the work into it, but I feel like it's a path that other people could follow as well of like, go on an adventure, look at some strategic places and then pick some random places along the way. And then something will happen and it will toss your plan in the garbage and you'll just have to react, but have yeah. a camera and get some, um, tutelage or like, like learn, like be engaged in it. So improve yeah. every day a little bit, push yourself a little bit. And then that adventure, just documenting it, like, that can't not lead to something because even if it's just a coffee table book, but you'll have the most kick ass coffee table book of any of your friends because it's your adventure yep. and you put your effort into it and you put your heart into it. So you come back to Philadelphia, you've got these amazing photographs and then, <laughs> and then I honestly like part of that trip actually did kickstart my photography career, I guess. And I, I still don't really know how to, place myself as how to categorize myself in a sense, because, um, I don't really necessarily consider myself an artist per se. Like I am, I, I do, I use art to make things, but I also like to tell a story. So I, there's like a mixture of like documentarian, anthropologist, journalist, philosopher, you know, like, there, there are these two dichotomies that um, are that that are interwoven, but also contrasted. So I don't really fit in many camps, <laughs> especially in the fine art world. You know, like they don't; those guys don't get me, <laughs> you know? and I also don't get them sometimes. Um, 
but and and none of that is there's no like judgment on any of those things right. you know yeah. it, it just is and um so yeah i came back and i applied to university of pennsylvania which is an ivy league school here in the united states um one of the top 10 schools in the united states as well and it was one of those things that i was just like ah you know I was very resistant to because I am actually resistant to a lot of uh, formal education just due to like the amount of debt you take on. And I think if there's other ways you can learn things, it's it's great to do that. But also looking at some other variables in my life and where I had been before with living in my car, uh, I was also like, you know, <clears throat> you know, having a stabilizer might not be a bad idea you know it might not be a, a a bad place to go back to and i felt a little little lost kind of when i came back so this this was a good opportunity for me to branch into something that i was actually kind of scared of too because honestly like i was a horrible ac academic you know a horrible student and uh, even just growing up, like going going through grade school. I mean, I graduated second last of my high school class of like 700 people. You know, I am not the profile of a student that gets into an Ivy League university. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know? So just just getting there was interestingly interestingly like enough. And um, the reason I applied is my wife challenged me, you know, to to at least like look into it and to check it out. She went to law school at, at Penn as well. And uh, she's a very vigorous academic and that's like definitely her camp. And we've had discussions about this quite a bit. <laughs> um, and I went and I talked to some of the advisors there and um, basically applied and almost in like is like an I'll show you like I won't get in you know and I won't like this isn't for me and I still like there is still points through my academic career where I'm like oh man like I need I like I feel so stifled and I should be doing my own thing and I should be focusing on my my like work or my business sense and stuff but I will say I have to remind myself like I am fortunate to be where I am because of the connections I've made, because of the things I've learned, and um, it, it has helped me, uh, I think, drastically grow as a, a person and how I think and critically think and solve problems and communicate. And um, it also gave me access to like tons of equipment. Um, I had an interview with NASA. You know, like there's all sorts of crazy stuff just because of my. Uh, attachment to the university and uh, the opportunities that are there through grant scholarships, fellowships, uh, you know, you name it. So I, I hope that's, and then I was working at Wharton, which is also part of the university, which I've, I, I've turned, I've, I've really reduced because things are starting to take off for me with just photography on my own. Interesting. Sorry. That was a long answer. No, no, no. <laughs> I, and I, I'm always fascinated now because, um, you know, there's a, there's the unschooling movement or this, in, right. I feel, feel like even all the things that I'm doing flies in the face of education. However, I do say that if you can find the right school or the right instructor, like it's really personalized. Like if you want to go and work in Hollywood, it makes sense to go to a school in Hollywood and have yeah. teachers who are working in Hollywood. They can just open in the, the industry. You yeah. can just walk through that door. They can say, meet this person. Yep. And then you're good. But if you yeah. want to work in Hollywood and you don't want to travel across the country and you're in Cleveland, Ohio or something, and then it's, it's, you have to, it's, it's sort of like, you, you know, you have to really look at what your, your opportunities are and if they're your educational opportunities are, and if they're in alignment, because if they're yes. not, yes, then, then you have to choose an alternate path and it can be really confusing to know. Uh, what that looks like, I think. You know, I I didn't know. I want to go to San Francisco. What is in San Francisco for me? Uh, I'm a very sure it expensive awesome. real estate. <laughs> it would be really expensive, and you know, I probably yeah. would be in Silicon Valley or something with a with a yeah. green card holder, uh, you know, and a and a wife. Yeah. 
or something, you know? Right. I, I have no idea. But it, it wouldn't have got me on that path to video games. And I think right. I didn't know that when I was a kid. And so I, I sort of feel like you're in a good place because you can look back look f and have the ability to look forward and be like, well, will this get me to where I want to be in five years or ten years? Am I on that right vector? Yeah. And if I'm not, okay, well, then it's a pretty easy decision. But if, if I am, th then awesome. You do get access yeah. to all that stuff that, that, that only comes through the school. Yep. Yeah. So it, I only have about a year left. I mean, it's technically not even a year, two semesters, and I'm not even going to be taking a full course load. Um, so I think that's really going to give me a more time with my daughter, which I'm really excited about and B um, more time to study real estate and C more time to focus on my photography and the processes of um, my work. Uh, I, I like to liken it to not just uh, capturing an image, but also capturing an emotion and feeling what I, what I uh, was experiencing at the time. And um, almost have like a, a painterly feel like that's that's where I think the art and the philosophy um, kind of comes into in, interplays with it and then the narrative the writing and and whatnot no I think th this could be a, a heavy question I don't think there's any way that you could shortcut in getting to where you are now but I mm -hmm. feel like the Derek that I met initially was the the, the the DNA, the core components were still there. You're still like really curious about the world. You still had an amazing work ethic. Um, you could meet the right people at the right times. You're willing to take risks. But I feel like there was maybe a, an I idealistic outlook of uh, comic books in specifically. And from the outside, mm. looking, looking at what you're doing, it felt like, you're very talented at the comic books or I mean, talent is not the right word, but you, you like you, you were doing it. Right. You, you weren't dabbling. It's not like you were a weekend warrior. Uh, once no. in a while you, might do, you were in it fully, yeah. but it's yeah. so, so hard. And so I'm asking this question on behalf of the people that the literally hordes of people that I talk with that yeah. are like, I want to tell stories and make comic books. Sure. And I feel like th what would, and I feel like that's that's the Derek that I met. And the difference between you and a lot of people I talked to is that you were actually putting in the 60 hours a week, the 80 hours a week to work towards yeah. it. A lot of people aren't willing to do that. But for somebody right. who was, what would Derek today say? Not that there's any regrets, but would right. say to, to Derek from five or six years ago about this idealistic journey of like telling stories um, hmm. that you have perspective on now because you've gone on this like amazing journey yeah. What would you tell yourself? Wow. Um, that is actually, you know, and I'm not BSing here. That actually is a very hard question to answer because, and I, and I hope I don't want to like cop out the answer here either, but you know, it's one of those things where it's like all the, the sequence of events that I, I, I went through led me to where I am now. So if I went back and told myself these things, you know, where would that lead me? You know, would it get me to a place faster or would it discourage me? You know, <laughs> so um, there is, uh, I guess, like that philosophical quarry, you know, in, in my mind, I'm like, hmm. <laughs> um, but I think one thing, just if we like narrow it down to comic books, like you said, and um, I think I would have really asked myself, Derek, is this something you really want to do? Or is this something you think is all you can do. And if I answered that question honestly to myself, I would have said, this is something I, this is the only thing I think I have to give to the world. So this is what I am going to give. And this is what is expected of me to give to the world, you know, by my peers or my, my family and this is my talent so i have to use it i have to do it and i like comics and not that it was a waste of time because it wasn't it's really given me uh, an advantage in multiple multiple layers but it was for me not the wrong path but just a side path in the journey to get back on 
a road of some set uh, of some sort to um, reach fulfillment because I, like you said, I was putting in the hours, I was putting in the time. And I think that's like the first hurdle for so many people who say they want to be like, it's not, you can't want to be, you just are, you know, and if you're getting paid or not, like either if it's like a hobby or, you know, your job, like if you're still producing and still practicing and still like you, you live for it. Like when I was in Tokyo recently, I went with a, a collective of artists and I just didn't understand like how other people weren't waking up at 5 a.m. and going to sleep at midnight because there's so many things to experience and photograph. Like we were there for two weeks. How do you not always have a camera and I always like, like, why isn't your back hurting? Like, why, why, why aren't you like in, in, in the, uh, the thick of it like why aren't you working and so fundamentally like you you you, you can't just you, you can't just like want it has to be like an embodiment and part of you and that's part of work ethic but also like you know what you foresee yourself doing because comics is like man that's like a head lopping career man yeah. like yeah, like yeah, they will so, just so, cut you down. That's why it's I'm hard. So hesitant to recommend people <clears throat> to to just blindly go down this path. Um, and right. it's like oh, I really want to make comics. It's like, well, then make a comic. There's literally nothing yeah. in between you and sitting down and making a comic yeah. right now. Well, yeah. I don't have X Y Z things. It's like, well, even you don't need you, it, man. Even you just telling me that. You don't got it. You don't have yeah. enough. Like you should just be able to. I wanted to make comics. I was making comics when I was ten years old. Yeah. Like you, you just yeah. they're not good comics. <laughs> Nobody, nobody's. You made them. them, but but you just make them and you just love it yeah. and you're, you're putting in that effort. And um, I think that's that's interesting though. What what you said is that the the only thing that you thought you could do and the thing that you thought was expected of you. Um, but I and what I feel like you said there was just realizing that. You have so much, so many more things to give to the world, so you don't regret it yeah. at all. You can tell no. amazing stories. You know how a story is put yeah. together. You know what it's like to be in a meat grinder. You know how right. fortunate you are now to hopefully not be in a meat grinder. You know, <laughs> right? And and that no. life doesn't have to be yeah. so difficult uh, because yeah. I feel like you know what, while people want to make comic books, you're going against uh, a trend. You know. Um, yeah. I think this will be my my last piece that I'll, I'll talk about here. But uh, sure. recently, I was I was in Philadelphia for Artisticon, and I spoke with um, Mike Manley, who I, I'm hoping to have on to the podcast, who's awesome. just a huge wealth of knowledge. And he was saying how, you know, kids these days don't read, uh, don't read paper stuff. Yeah, they read all on the screen. And he was saying that that my generation was the last generation to collect comic books. I know I've got like. Spawn was one, and and he had yeah. Darkhawk, and I love Darkhawk. Awesome, got like tons of Darkhawk comic books. Um, oh, that's so good. And but I didn't think of it like that. That that mm -hmm. you know, there there was a line, and and I, and it just keeps we just keep aging up, and it's changed, yeah. and so you're working against that, and it doesn't mean that there aren't people creating comics. There's maybe more people than ever creating comics. It's just that yeah, they're yeah. not creating Spider-Mans or whatever. They want to tell their own stories and then you have to figure out, I mean, that's a whole different journey to figure out how do you make this thing right. work when you're, everyone's basically giving their work away for free. Um, right. It's hard. It's hard. And, and, and just because I'm not working a hundred percent professionally in this industry anymore. It doesn't mean I've failed or anything. Like doesn't mean I can't ever make a comic book again. I'm writing a story and I plan in the next five years of putting it together. And it's based off my grandfather's uh, manuscript through his interview for the Lion Fairy Congress, <clears throat> excuse me, from when he fought Nazis in France, you know, in the United States army, you know, and it's got like a fantasy sci-fi twist that I've been adding to it. So that's a thing that is being slowly built and worked on. Um, how I'm putting together a photo book because I'm returning to Tokyo and um, Kyoto. And uh, I'm basically making a photo book that is a story that is aligned with – it's basically like the spirit of the, these woodblock printers from – the 17th, 18th, 
19th century in Japan, and they basically would make like a huge collective of images, and um, it, it's like you know, like the wave, yeah. like that really famous image. Yushigi. It's a part of, yeah, it's 36. Uh, was it 36 images of uh, Tokyo or stations of Tokyo or Edo? Um, so it's kind of like in that same spirit, like writing and then imagery and and whatnot. So I mean, that's still kind of comics, you know. And if you look at some of these woodblock printers, they they look like they were yeah. comic book artists. It's crazy, man. Yeah, yeah. So there's just because like you deviate from this path that you think you've been put on, or or you think like you should be on. You know, it's very hard. Even when I changed my Instagram, like I went from like this illustrative Insta Instagram account, account that had like high engagement, like really like pumping, really moving up, moving forward. And then I started posting photos and it's just like, you know, like right, yeah. plane crash. Audience. Yeah. You just, you have to commit. That's it. Like whatever it is you do, you have to commit. If you don't commit and like go through the, the hurt, you know, the pain of, you know, an audience change or, you know, the pain of looking at the past 10 years of drawing and practicing and being like, oh, d did I do that for nothing? And working through that, like, yeah, whatever it is you decide to do, you have to commit to doing it with wholeheartedly. Because if you don't do that, you're just, you're half-assing it and it's not going to get you anywhere. I think I did I just as we've been talking here, I was thinking like what what I feel like you're doing and what I've tried to do, and I feel like the stories that on the podcast that are most inspiring to me are the people who are living. You know, like when I die, my podcast, I hope it or not my podcast, my tombstone, I hope it says like this guy lived. You know, like <laughs> <Your pocket. laughs> the, the, yeah. that movie Big Fish where you know, he passes away and then all these people come to his funeral yeah. and he's like, Wow, are all these stories real? I thought he was lying right. the whole time. It's like, that, that's what I, I, I hope to aspire to be, that my last act is like having this funeral where it's like, holy shit. Yeah. This was, uh, this guy did some stuff. This is pretty right. cool. I didn't know about all these other things. And it's like, yeah, I'm too too busy doing it. You're too busy yeah. doing it to, to really talk about a lot of this stuff. It's sort of like, if you meet me in the moment when I'm doing the, this thing now, I'm yeah. all in. But next yeah. year I might not be all in. I might be all in on yeah. something else. And so I really right. appreciate that you keep pushing. And um, I feel like this is probably the end of the. Uh, sure. Th like this, this puts a nice bow on on the the, the previous episodes. And I yeah. appreciate you sharing the journey with with us. And wish you yeah. all the success in the world for for everything that's coming forward. Thank you so much. And uh, same thing for you too. And I will add one more thing um, to to tie the knot here is. Um, artists, if you if you are pursuing a career in the arts, also become educated in ways to manage a business, way to manage your finances, learn about finance, learn about uh, investment opportunities and building assets and a portfolio and all that stuff. Like it's it's vital to your security, and that's a whole another thing. But I just that's something I just had to say. <laughs> yeah, well, I don't know. Maybe that's the next. That's the next chapter. You can come back and tell us how yeah. the next couple. Uh, yeah, that sounds good. Have been. All right. Thank you so much, Derek. Right. Appreciate you hopping right. on. Thank you, Rich. Yeah, appreciate it. Thanks, brother. That's it for those of the Pencil King show. Thanks for hanging out. If you're watching us on YouTube, you can always grab us on iTunes if you want to listen in the car, at the gym, whatever you want. If you are listening and you want to watch and see what's happening, you can always go over to YouTube and look up Pencil Kings and you'll find us there. We'll be back next Wednesday with another episode of the show. And until then, stay creative. Ah, you talk like a fool. I would trade a century of practice for an ounce of inspiration.